Good evening. I want to call this meeting. Uh, it's a work session of the Salem City Council to order uh, January 18th. If the recorder please call a roll. Councillor Stapleton. Here. Councillor Anderson. Councillor Phillips. Here. Councillor Leung. Here. Councillor Gonzalez. Here. Councillor Hoy. Here. Councillor Nordyke. Here. Councillor Lewis. Here. Mayor Bennett. Here. Okay, we join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, Councillor Hoy, a motion to approve the special meeting agenda. I move approval of the special meeting agenda. Second. Second by Phillips. Any discussion? Okay, uh, just note, Councillor Anderson has joined us. Um, so we will vote on the motion. The recorder call a roll. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Leung? Aye. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Uh, I don't believe there are any additions or deletions, Councillor? No. no. Okay. Correct, there are not. Okay, we'll move then into the work session. Work session is uh, on Council uh, goals. We're going to begin with the unsheltered response activities portion of this, and I'll turn it over to Courtney to kind of get us going here. What uh, What's your plan here, Courtney? Thank you so much, Council, uh, Mayor Bennett. This is Courtney, and I'm um, just going to give a quick introduction to Colleen Rosillas. You might remember her from Los Adams. She's been helping us through some strategic planning work as we've been doing this for now since 2016 and um, our annual policy agenda. For tonight, there are four key topics on the policy agenda for your consideration. And the first is really about working with our unsheltered neighbors. And so we're going to start the evening off on that topic and then reserve the remainder of the time for the other three topics. So with your permission, we'll just get started. Okay. Thank you. Colleen? All right, good evening, everyone. Um, Happy New Year, it's good to see you. Um, it's been a couple of months since our last work session. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share our slideshow for tonight. Um, so our purpose tonight is to, as Courtney said, review um, our, con our progress from our last work session where we identified those four major priorities and gained some consensus on our policy direction for this next fiscal year. Far and away in, our, in that work session in November, um, the number one priority was respond responding to our sheltering crisis. Um, so we'll have a couple of presentations from staff to get centered in what our options are for priority setting there. Um, we can take as much time on that priority tonight as we need to um, and address the other priorities with the remaining time that we have. Um, as a reminder, the four priorities were responding to our sheltering crisis, planning for our future, engaging our community, and sustaining infrastructure and services. Um, oh, I just stole my own thunder by saying that on that slide versus this one. All right, we're already ahead of schedule, Mayor Bennett, so I'm getting you uh, what you wanted. All right, so, and as a reminder, the strategic plan that we adopted last year, um, we established the model of the, city, uh, the city's role in the strategic plan, in the goals, objectives, and strategies that we adopt. Um, so we identify whether the city is a doer, a partner, or a convener in this work because the city can't do everything. 
um, and be everything to everyone in these large cross-functional challenges that we're trying to solve. So just trying to remember that as we're talking about our priorities, that these do involve community partners, that they involve large cross-agency, cross-jurisdictional efforts. I know that you all are aware of that as we tackle some of these big challenges, but wanted to just give you a reminder of that as we move through this tonight. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to Josh to talk through the unsheltered spending plan and potential investments. Good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. I'm going to share my screen and uh, walk you through attachment one to the first staff report this evening. Can everyone see that? Yep. Excellent. <clears throat> So just to orient you, a uh, couple things to note. Uh, this is a proposed spending plan uh, for your, your reaction, your direction. Um, we're currently looking at fiscal year, sorry. Um, we're currently looking at fiscal year 2022 in the current year. And then we're looking at uh, fiscal year 2023 through 2027. Again, this is just a plan. It's not a, a budget or anything like that. It's just simply a scenario. Um, so on the right, you can see the years across the top, and then to orient in a little bit, there's some color coding going on with some different funding sources. Um, we have the state grant for the navigation center, as you might remember, we received five million dollars to operate the navigation center. Um, so this first category is focused on that navigation center, and we've programmed that operating funds for these four years, and so it fully covers the the current budget for that operation. Uh, for the first three years, and then you'll see this category when it turns red uh, is unfunded or it's yet to be funded. So it needs to find a funding source to continue that um, that operation. Uh, the acquisition construction, you might remember in at the tail end of the budget cycle, you guys allocated $3 million for the purchase of that building. And then since then, we've had a, a need to finish constructing the inside of that facility uh, for tenant improvements. And that shortfall right now is $5 million. We do have an ask for Marion County and the state legislature to make up that difference. And uh, we're feeling fairly positive about that, but it is an unfunded need currently. And then this, uh, this 272,000 is a, a portion that use a contract that wasn't eligible for ARPA. So it's just using this uh, next funding source, the $10.5 million, the state grant from the legislature that you guys just approved the last couple months um, to make up that small amount that's not eligible for ARPA funding. And the, the green, uh, I just mentioned that the ARPA, that's American Rescue Plan Act funds. Uh, at the tail end of the budget cycle, you guys allocated $8.1 million for unsheltering. Uh, the largest piece, single piece of it was this for the purchase of the navigation center. Any questions on this navigation center section, or is that clear? Uh, one of the one of the questions I have is just looking at this uh, uh, spreadsheet. Is it runs out five years? Is that what you're anticipating? This this set of programs will last is five years. Are we? What are we doing here with this? Is this not to get people out of homelessness? Get people off drugs? Resolve certain kinds of vagrancy problems? and get people back to work. I mean, what is the, what's the, what's the end game here? This looks like a long term. We're going to support these people for a long time. Excellent question. So this is simply a scenario to show when the money, if you were to continue all the current investments, when it would run out. So it's only to put a budget fiscal context to your conversation this evening. Um, it only goes out to five years because that's how long the navigation center funding is goes for, I wanted to do it past then, uh, but certainly you could start or stop any investment at your discretion. Okay. Well, it would seem like there is a, at somewhere, somewhere in this discussion is an objective to cut the tail on this thing, or it's going to last forever and get bigger and bigger. I, I don't know. Maybe that's where we're headed, but uh, it would seem like something you'd want to uh, call an end to at some point. Oh, Tom, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I actually 
hit the button to raise my hand. I thought I did pretty good. I know. I, I'm glad you did. I would have missed it. I'm sorry. That's all quite all right. Uh, Josh, I've got two questions. And one is not so much a question, kind of in response, uh, in addition to the mayor's remarks. Uh, I, I think another way to say what he said is at some point we have to see some sort of return in our investment. Yeah. Um, um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and so I'm not saying that that uh, I wouldn't be in favor of continuing this out that far because I probably would, but I would be more in favor of continuing it on if we see that we have had some success moving forward. Uh, the other question I have is about the five million unfunded that you think we could we're going to be able to get money from either the county or the state when will we know this and uh uh because i presume that'll affect our budget planning for the fiscal years after that if we don't get it in 2022 you are correct um if we if we don't secure that some other way we would look to a funding source that's currently allocated to something else um but all that uh Gretchen, if you don't mind answering that question. Yeah, we're, we're working on a model of trying to understand the outcomes of each of the shelters, like what kind of outcome could the navigation center achieve? What kind of outcome could the micro shelter program achieve? What is the, how do you project the population currently and be able to make some long-term projections related to the return on investment pieces you suggested? With the Navigation Center, I know the community partner, the Mid Willamette Valley Community Action Agency is also at work looking to diversify its funding sources so that there can be um, additional revenue streams coming in to fund operations on this. Councilor Anderson, is that? Uh, that answered the first part of my question. The second part are my comments and, and I encourage I mean, I, I think that's a good idea to see um, uh, what's happening in these places. Um, the, this, although I will say again, that doesn't mean I don't necessarily want to fund them, but it certainly gives me a better idea of, of what we're getting for our money. But the second one is when are we going to know if we're going to get this $5 million or not? Forgive me. I don't, I, I missed that part. I don't have firm dates on that precisely tonight. I will certainly update you just as soon as possible. Okay. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think my question or comments are kind of a similar combination of the mayor's and Councilor Anderson's. And I, I was just wondering, and this is probably more of a question for Gretchen, but it seems that we're missing some metrics on here. I mean, we're just talking about dollars, which really doesn't tell us a lot. We really, I think it would be helpful to be able to understand the number of people we're intending to serve during this time. And, you know, we can start using some of the information we're starting to get from Church of the Park and other places about, you know, outcomes. And we can sort of extrapolate from there. But at some point, I, I really want to see some numbers of in terms of the people served. And what are the goals of each one of these? Are there what's the goal of the navigation center in terms of people served? But what about one of the micro shelter sites? You know, we we keep talking about setting up more of them, and I'm hoping we're going to. But I, I would really like to understand, you know, what are we what are we getting for that money in terms of people served, not in terms of sites, but in terms of actual lives impacted? Yeah, yeah. Thank thank you. I uh, the other I think is also also to the extent possible understanding who our target populations are. I mean, at a certain point, we need to understand what and define the mental health portion of this and look for partners based on their responsibilities. Drug addiction and alcohol addiction and sort of that general vagrancy that goes with that has another kind of another component. And then there's the, the truly this is just my theory, the truly homeless who have run into an economic circumstance or a social circumstance uh, that has uh, cut them off from uh, sort of more traditional or, or uh, existing housing opportunities and how that's being resolved and, and uh, looking into that population as to how we're going to serve them. Because they're to me, they're very distinct different populations, some of which I'm, I, I think 
I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm reading the comments I get all wrong, but I know that there appears to be uh, some real frustration with at least the vagrant, drug addicted, alcohol addicted population and the way they're handling themselves and how that gets resolved at some point, I think is real important. Thank you. I think in the next piece that I do, we'll get a chance to touch on more of those topics. Oh, and I'm sorry, Cynthia, this is Gretchen. I so appreciate the recognition of the varied um, situations um, that represent our population. Um, we wanted to begin with giving you some context financially in recognition of the number of threads um, and potential requests coming at you. So hence beginning on the sheltering, on the financial forecast, but we'll quickly pivot into these other pieces. Thank you so much. Okay, you wanna move? Oh, I'm sorry, gosh, uh, Jose, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor, this is Jose Gonzalez. Uh, you know, um, we talked a little bit about some of these, these funds coming from other places. And this is our document, but if we're talking about the state, the county, uh, maybe this is a document we should be sharing with them to see if we can get some, I'm not saying they're gonna pre-approve any funding going forward, but at least if they know what we're trying to do here, they're a part of it too, because we're, you know, we're, um, we're all partners in this. You know, so somehow if they were clear on what we were trying to do financially, then I think it'll be easier for them to come on board instead of this game of we're gonna ask and then wait you know, so maybe we can do a little bit, of, be a little more proactive. Mm -hmm. Councillor Lewis. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, and I agree with uh, with uh, Councillor Gonzalez. Um, the more we can communicate with our partners, the better. But I wanted to go back a little bit uh, on Councillor Anderson's uh, thought about when will we find out about the $5 million. I'm assuming that the legislature will uh, will restrict itself to 35 days. So uh, we should have the answer from them within 35 days after February 1st. And quite frankly, if we haven't asked the county, uh, Marion County, to uh, to make a decision in that same time frame, I think we should be because uh, the one thing I know that we need to do is move forward on this as quickly as possible. I, I want to assure you we are working on these, that, that uh, meetings are set up with the county to go over this. We, we're talking with our... Uh, talking with legislators about it. Uh, we're working our way through this. It's not just sitting there. Uh, it's not just on this spreadsheet. Uh, Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Chris Hoy. So one of the things I think it's important to remember that we, you know, the people who are homeless in Salem or, and everywhere, you know, they're in whatever circumstance they're in and we can do nothing or we can just meet each one of them where, wherever they're at and address their issues and help them try to get to a better outcome. Frankly, the folks who don't have a lot of additional issues like maybe addiction or, or other or mental health issues, those folks generally get the services they need from our, from our providers and we don't hear from them again because they, they avail themselves of the services and uh, they're on to a better place, and which is great. But the folks that who are chronically homeless, and as a reminder, our percentage of chronically homeless in the Marion County and Marion Polk region is twice the national twice the national average in terms of a percentage of the folks who are homeless. You know, they, they come with a lot of uh, additional needs, and we just have to create some sort of fabric that uh, meets those needs. And so. You know, we don't talk a lot about the people who are who have a low level of needs because they get the services, they have the supports they need, and they move on. Uh, we're really talking about the people that uh, have a lot more complex needs. Councilor Leung. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is Jackie Leung, City Councilor for Ward 4 speaking. Um, I have to agree with Councilor Hoy in terms of, you know, when we are um, discussing and specifically talking about our unsheltered communities, you know, not everybody is going to be able to even come still to these, um, to, uh, to either the navigation center or even to the micro shelters. There's still people who are still chronically homeless because they have other mental health issues or other situations that make it impossible for them to be within these spaces. So when we speak about the unsheltered, we have to be a little bit more mindful of our language 
I mean, I think of this one individual that I see constantly within my ward. Uh, when I officially, when I first started seeing him, like he he was he he, he was better dressed at that time, and his hair was a little bit um, was a little bit messed up. But he, at least he he was walking around. And occasionally, he'd be talking to randomly, screaming randomly. But now, when I see him, especially over the last few months, his 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 whole demeanor has significantly changed and it's been altered. I already spoke to some people at Arches about this and they're trying to find him now, but his pants are so loose where it's pretty much falling off of him. And like he walks around showing off his um walking around his buttocks is showing when he's um depending on how he's walking. So when we are thinking about who we're trying to help and who we're trying to support, we also start to recognize there will still be people who will still be out there needing assistance. Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Yeah, this is Councillor Phillips, Ward 3. Um, so, I mean, I have a series of, of comments um, and I just want to confirm uh, that, that you know, this is is mainly budgetary. Like the, the five-year frame is kind of similar to what we see on the Finance Committee. And this is just, uh, my understanding is that staff's goal in reviewing this was to show us um, the numbers and, and, and not necessarily the metrics. Um, I mean, I think to the best of my recollection, uh, when Jimmy Jones presented on the Navigation Center, the hope was that they could serve 30 to 60 clients every three to six months and that they thought that they could pretty conservatively end homelessness or move someone to the next step on the on the, the rung of unsheltered to permanent supportive housing in, in terms of about 100 people per year. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, my thoughts on this is that we have to have a Navigation Center in this community. I'm not sure that there's going to be an expiration date on something like a navigation center. We don't really have a low barrier or no barrier alternative at this point, which is probably why it's been the number one, you know, policy agenda for several years, you know, mm -hmm. prior to my term. So it's a, it's a big deal that we're getting so close. I just want to make sure that our, our, our uh, fellow, you know, the county and the state understands, I'm sure they do, that we don't have any wiggle room in our budget. So we really are counting on that, you know, that funding of those $5 million. Um, and then just, you know, I'm going to share my thoughts with for staff's sake and for my colleagues' sake. But I do think, you know, finalizing the Navigation Center is still priority number one. I'll breathe a sigh of relief when that's done. Um, and then, you know, the, the testimony from DJ Vincent during our last session in terms of the first year metrics on the, the micro shelter sites that are managed is that we ended homelessness for, again, about 100 people. Um, and the percentages were quite high compared to like my understanding of norms, um, you know, in terms of servicing, um, you know, people that are living with the issue of, of, of being unsheltered. So, you know, I, I agree with the fellow counselors that want, you know, that, that metric data tied directly to this as a reminder, so we don't just have to remember, you know, brute memorization, these numbers. But I, I do think the Navigation Center is like the biggest, you know, new thing that's high priority and a close second is those micro shelters. My big takeaway from this is that we don't have any extra financial funds right now to go beyond just the two micro shelter sites that we have currently stood up. Um, we, we will be able to transition away from the Portland uh, Road site to a new site, but then you know through 2024, we've only got enough funds with those historic funds from ARPA and from the state to fund those two things operationally through the end of 2024. And then those micro shelter sites are, you know, the biggest, you know, question mark of what do we want to do as a community in terms of filling, you know, the red starting in 2025. And I don't have easy answers there because, you know, math mathematically, we are still not meeting, you know, the low hanging fruit of, of sheltering people that could be sheltered on any given night. I mean, we're, we're with this, we're looking at a couple hundred. But, you know, we've got a thousand on any given night that are unsheltered. And my understanding is you've got to get close to 50 percent. Um, and then if you go beyond that, you're hitting people that are service resistant and can't really be helped in the short term. You know, we can continue to do things. But in terms of sheltering, we've got to push as close to 500 as possible as a community. And this may be overly simplistic, but, um, you know, there's good news here. We're trying. But like this is only 200. We've got several hundred more beds to try to do. And it's going to be difficult to find the revenue to do that. So I spoke a lot. Um, staff, feel free to correct me where I screwed up um, and, and answer anything that I alluded to in that uh, long comment. 
Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nordyke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all my colleagues for their thoughtful remarks. I appreciate the fact that we are having this conversation and setting aside the time we need to really discuss in depth what our path forward is. So lots of great comments already made, which I won't repeat. One of the things that strikes me about this chart is at the very bottom where it shows there really are just uh, three or maybe five funding sources being considered altogether. The Navigation Center funding, the $10.5 million grant we received from the state, the ARPA funds and general funds. And I would really encourage our staff to consider the full universe of potential options out there for funding sources. <clears throat> there may be some mental health services or other related services at these shelters, for example, that could be Medicaid reimbursable or that are reimbursable or billable to the Oregon Health Plan. Um, I feel like there are other sources out there that we don't understand because we are wading into new territory, because we are exploring shelter sites really for the first time in the city's history. And so I think it requires a lot of outside the box funding for a lot of creative sources. There may be more money out there than what's reflected on this chart. This is only the known universe. We don't know what we don't know, as uh, uh, a wise man once said. Uh, this also assumes that we are getting 10.5 million from the state and that we will never, ever, ever receive any other funds again from the state when it comes to sheltering, with the possible exception of some more money this particular short session. And I'm more optimistic than that. I think that the state recognizes the profound need to address homelessness and mental health and drug treatment. All the things we've all cited, this is on everybody's radar screen when once it was not, and it was all swept under the rug. So I anticipate there'll be more funding options out there. The other point I want to make is that it would be great to see uh, our, where our partners fall on this list. I see how much money the city is willing to spend to address homelessness, but I don't see how much money the counties are willing to spend to address homelessness. And the last time that my intern spoke to the chief financial officer for Marion County, it sure wasn't uh, $54 million. It wasn't $500,000 for a single budget cycle. So we need to see more skin in the game from our partners, full stop. And I just implore our staff to start looking at other creative options because the people being served at these places are getting all kinds of access to services. Finally, thank God for that. And I think there will be opportunities for reimbursement so that we're not paying everything out of general fund dollars or other one-time grant money from the state or the feds. Thank you. Thank you. And I that uh, certainly will be part of further discussions as we look at all of the partners we have uh, and the details of their programs. Uh, Councilor Leung. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, this is Jackie Leung, City Councilor for Ward 4. Um, I want to echo Councilor Nordyke, um, specifically looking into alternative funding sources. I brought up last week the possibility of the Medicaid reimbursement models, um, right. specifically through the use of the peer support specialists or peer wellness specialists in collaboration and conjunction with the coordinated care organizations. And specifically in Marion County or in Salem, it would be um, Pacific Source. So I strongly recommend and ask that staff take a look and contact uh, Pacific Source for what kind of options are available. If they need somebody to get in touch with, I do have a few contacts there that I'm happy to provide to staff so staff could get in touch and learn a little bit more about the peer support specialist Medicaid reimbursement model. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who's going to move us on? Colleen? Josh, is there anything else that you had related to finance that you wanted to present tonight? Mm. Yes, thank you. If I could just uh, finish going through the rest of the spreadsheet, I think that would give uh, the context. And again, it's just a spending plan. The fiscal year 2022 column is in the budget. The out years, of course, are up to the budget committee and the city council or program at that time. All we're trying to do is give a little financial context to the choices, you know, micro shelters versus a more direct response service. So just that, uh, that tension there. Um, as Councillor Phillips said, uh, we're looking at two micro shelters that are currently in this spending plan. 
the Portland Road and the Catholic Community Services. And then um, there's a small amount here. And this is just for full clarity, full transparency for those ARPA funds. Uh, Windows to the West uh, was a planned shelter site. Uh, it was go, 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 let's get it going. And then uh, it eventually couldn't be activated, but there were some costs incurred uh, by our operator to get that site going. So we are recognizing uh, this amount here, but we're, we're projecting uh, for these, for these, uh, these years, um, the three sites, just uh, to, so you know what's including the numbers. Uh, the general fund investments you're more familiar with, the safe park scattered sites, the homeless rental assistance program, the warming network, a small amount for towing, vehicle repair, clean supplies, biohazard and environmental cleanup. So this has been both in the parks and in the right of way. Um, a one time grant to Safe Sleep United uh, to expand their sheltering capacity. And then a one time grant to the uh, Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance. So everything that I've mentioned so far, at least in fiscal year 2022, are things that are approved by the city council. You guys have already taken action on those items. Right here, we start looking at new investments for your consideration. Uh, this top one is a uh, response service. It'd be uh, made up of six FTE, four public works employees, two police officers, uh, kind of as the flying squad to address homeless homelessness, really on that management side. Um, you know, small site cleanup. Um, it would really expand what's currently be done in, being done in one day on a Thursday, Thursdays to it'd be available to dispatch all five days. And uh, as you can see from the color, uh, that's proposed to use the state sheltering grant, that $10.5 million grant. The nonprofit work program, Gretchen, I'm going to see if you can just describe that real briefly. Or that would be a workforce development strategy to engage um, people um, with lived experience along with an experienced nonprofit operator to get out and strengthen our cleanup response, working to clean scattered sites throughout the city, engaging people who are camping in the solution. Thanks, Gretchen. Uh, th this third one here is the a project coordinator in the city manager's office. Uh, Gretchen does a lot of things, and I believe she could use some assistance for a lot more things. Um, just some additional help there, some capacity for coordination and other efforts. Uh, these last two are proposed for our ARPA funding, uh, Women's Shelter Expansion, an additional $200,000 one-time grant, um, and then a restoration of the Cascade Gateway restroom that was um, uh, really hit hard with the recent unmanaged camping in Cascade Gateway Park. This would restore it to a usable uh, condition. And then you already saw this summary, but just really briefly, you can see the totals here on the right of the funding available uh, and the totals by use. Um, and uh, as Councillor Phillips mentioned, this only goes out to 2024 when you start going into the unfunded category for the current investments and if you guys approved all the other potential investments. And of course, there's choices here. You could not do something in this category and do more, uh, say, on the micro shelter side or vice versa. It's, a, it's really just a planning tool for you guys to uh, use to gauge that uh, financial impact of the decisions. Uh, Josh, on the other potential investments, these uh, five programs you describe here what what do you need what's going on here is this is this going to be in the budget do you need uh, some sort of what do you need great question so if you guys gave us the direction that you'd like to move forward on these items we'd have an action item for you on your next council agenda to approve moving forward um, as you know if we add positions we need council authority to add those positions so we'd come back to you with that action item uh, to add those items. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, two things. One, uh, um, Cascade Gateway restroom, I've been out there and seen it, and I'm sure other councilors uh, have too. And not only is that in my ward, but it's also a park that is used by the whole city so i really am interested in in fixing up that restaurant uh restroom there um the other one is this um, um uh, responsive service which you propose to have two police and four public works 
uh, staff members on this, uh, I would very much be interested in on how and if that fits in with the mobile response team that we have been talking about at many council meetings, uh, starting with Councilor Nordyke and other councilors. Well, actually, it started with me before a long time ago, but how? Uh, but Councilor Nordyke has brought this to our attention most recently. How do those two things fit in? Because it seems like what they're dealing with were the same sort of things that a mobile response unit might be dealing with. So I don't know if that is that in addition to, is it coordination in coordination with, or is it in lieu of? You don't have to answer those in detail right now, but we're going to have to when we get when we get to the budgetary situation. Excellent. Do you do you have an answer, Josh? Yes, it is not a mobile response uh, unit as Councilor Nordyke, Nordyke is describing. And Gretchen, you might have more detail there. I expect that team to be fully trained as they will focus on this population in being trauma informed, in um, having um, de escalation skills, so that they will be excellent at their interactions with people and be able to make referrals as other parts of our system are built. Quick other comment on response services that also includes some money for towing, which we're concerned we've underballed. We have $100,000 in there for towing and believe the cost to actually be at $200,000 annually. Mr. Well, Mayor, Gretchen, Gretchen, could you describe the, the mission of the response services then? What is the mission? Yes, and I have a slideshow next that'll help with that. The idea okay. is to quickly respond to problems and situations that our community asks for help with at, in a timely fashion before things escalate. And to have dedicated staff as opposed to seeing who I can borrow from other teams. Is We're it a cleanup? Is it a cleanup or what is it? Clean up, um, assisting people with making different choices to different locations, resolving de uh, de-escalating situations, resolving conflicts. This, the daily diet that the community depends on us for every single day. Okay, Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much. This is Virginia Stapleton. Um, I had a quick question about the women's sheltering expansion. Could you tell me a little bit more about uh, who is gonna be running that, how that program is going to work off of what we already have um, as far as resources for women here in Salem? And yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm gathering information about options for you right now in recognition of the significant need for beds for all genders in Salem, trying to set aside some money because I understand there's projects that are potentially available to invest in. So I'm gathering some details and would bring that forward for you, but wanted to suggest earmarking some money. There, there are some one-time investments that look like we'd be able to contribute to. This is to add beds for women. Correct. Yes, okay. <laughs> Mayor, I had another yes. quick yeah. question. Um, again, this is Virginia. Um, question about the repairs out at Cascade Gateway uh, to the restrooms. Is that something that would also be eligible if we got the funding for the bond to pass? Could that be paid for out of that? Uh, it likely would be eligible, yes. Okay, and then the because these funds right here are from for, for sheltering specifically so there's probably more uh, strings attached to the money that we have set aside for that right now versus uh, maybe another pot for the repairs out at Cascade it's it's certainly possible I wouldn't want to presume the passage of the bond at this point yeah. <laughs> thank you Councillor North is are you done Virginia any anything else done okay Councillor Nordyke uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to uh, piggyback on the remarks that Councillor Anderson made, uh, looking at the response services. Mm -hmm. um, as I understand it, this would be to fund public work staff and public work staff mainly for the purposes of garbage service and cleanup, which is not at all responding to crisis and right. nor would be, uh, frankly, when I take a look at the $10.5 million grant agreement, when I read the fine print, I think it is a stretch at best to use that $10.5 million for a cleanup crew. So I question whether or not that's an appropriate usage of the grant funding. But even if it was, 
Uh, this is funding that would be used in lieu of the mobile crisis unit that Councillor Anderson and others, myself included, have been championing for a long time now. So I'm not in favor of that. When I look at $750,000, I think of the fact that when United Way brought their proposal to us, they said a year would cost $540,000 for a mobile crisis unit. So let's just say, hypothetically speaking, that we use 540 of that for a mobile crisis unit, that would leave money left over to do the garbage and other cleanup duty involved here. But it's not a best practice to send police officers to individuals who are homeless and in crisis. And if you take a look at the best practices put forward by Crisis International, they can, I can share that at another time. But I would say right off the bat, that's a big concern of mine is investing all that money into those services when number one i don't think it's the best use or a proper use of the grant money and number two you have to look at the opportunity costs when you fund everything on this spreadsheet remember what we are not funding instead and to councillor stapleton's point uh there may be, That's this is one of the reasons why I said, is this really the universe of funding for these projects? And I think Councillor Stapleton is correct. We can use bond money, the infrastructure bond money for the restroom, uh, which, and it's $650,000. I mean, that's a lot. Um, there are plenty of things that we could do. Perhaps we could buy a piece of property uh, for a shelter site. There are all kinds of potential things we can do with $650,000. And so again, I, once that money is gone, it is gone because it is one time funds. So those are the two concerns I raise. I'm not in favor of the response services as drafted. Boy, I don't know. My email and phone calls are, are exactly what that kind of response service would resolve because of the garbage, the parked vehicles, the uh, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm the only person that gets those calls. It's not somebody yelling uh, or having a, a mental health crisis. It's somebody creating a health crisis with uh, garbage and defecation and the rest of it. So I don't know. Apparently, we're all having different experiences with this issue. Councillor Lewis? Um, yeah, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this, but I, I would have to agree that what I hear mostly, and I think the comments that we received on the issue tonight is um, the, the city uh, the citizens want us to be cleaner. Um, they also want us to have the emergency response units. I get that. Um, but, but the majority, uh, more prominent is the, is the cleanup. Uh, so it, it brings me to a, a question because um, the ARPA funds, do we have more or less flexibility with those funds than with the straight state grant for sheltering? And my specific question is, quite frankly, could the ARPA funds, rather than do the Cascade Gateway bathroom, could they be used for the pilot project for the emergency response team? Uh, excellent question. I'd have to go back and uh, look at the compliance documents and consult with legal, uh, but it's it's possible. I, I want to follow it up. I um, I appreciate the destruction that's been happened in both Cascade Gateway Park and Wallace Marine Park, um, and then they're going to take time and, and money to to clean them up. That's all there is to it. But um, my focus, and I want our focus to be, is addressing the homelessness issue not necessarily making up for what it has caused, but to focus on alleviating it as much as possible. Okay. All right. Uh, if I could, I'm, Mr. Mayor, I'm yeah. sorry, I have one more, one more question. Um, yeah. The, the, micro, the current micro shelter on Portland Road, that ends in May of 2022, why? There is a hard, oh, this is Gretchen, Cynthia. There is a hard deed restriction on the allowance of sheltering beyond 18 months at that property. And so we're, we're unable to expend that service at that time. And the owner of the property who is? And I can speak to that, Gretchen, if that would help. This is Kristen Rutherford, Urban Development Director. 
Counselor, when we acquired that property, we had to obtain a prospective purchaser agree agreement um, through DEQ and the prior owners to protect the city um, relating to environmental contamination on the property. And in getting that prospective purchaser agreement and working with DEQ, DEQ placed a restriction on the property for residential use. Uh, we approached them to see if there was a way we could get a temporary lift of that or a waiver of some type to use it for interim shelter. We received that a couple years ago, uh, but they put an 18 month limitation on it. And so that expires in May. I don't want to belinger the point, but we can't go back and say, hey, extend it again for a year because we need it. We have a, we have had conversations with them. We do have that limitation and um, it, it just, it is what it is. Okay. And my last question, if I could remind me how many uh, shelters are at that site on Portland Road? 20. 20. And right. in addition, there's, I believe, eight Parking. vehicles for Safe Park. Right. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, but as a reminder for folks, it's 20 shelters that hold two people each, so it's for 40 people. That's just an important right. point to remember. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Counselor. Okay, what next? That would be me. Can everyone see my screen okay? No. Yeah. Okay. It blipped through a minute ago. How about there now? Yeah. Very good. This is a brief, a brief opportunity on exactly what you were just discussing. Um, those help requests that I know all of you and all of us are receiving on a regular basis around um, managing that that part of the preventing, managing, and ending uh, continuum. We get daily urgent requests just to help in situations. Um, first, just to understand, is, as counselors were discussing earlier around the numbers, we do have one year old and undercounted data that is specific to the city of Salem, which is the, um, which is the, um, I'm sorry, just one moment. I have a note that the demonstrate, the slide is not showing very well for you all. Can you see a yeah, little better I now? No, it's gone now. Okay, just one moment while I try to there fix you go. the correction. I think that might be the best I'm able to do. Can you all it's see good. that okay? Yeah, that's good. How about that? That's good too. Okay, thanks for your patience with me. Um, but we do understand um, this to be an undercount. We understand right now we have about 456 year and year round beds with additional capacity um, in warming and also underway with investments that you and the regional partners have contributed in investing. Um, what we understand we need is more varied gender beds. In any given night, you really are unlikely to find a bed if you're female or if you have, um, it, it, depending on your gender, um, or if, if you're really seeking a low barrier option, we have a lot of challenges that remain. Um, but this is a snapshot from the Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance about current and aspirational beds. As we were discussing, we're struggling helping everyone outside get to a better option. It's clear the community consensus is around your council objectives about a livable and safe community, but we hit all kinds of problems helping people get indoors. Um, we have challenges with people who really qualify for the permanent supportive housing efforts the Salem Housing Authority builds, but there's a waiting list. People who would succeed being rapidly rehoused, but we aren't able to locate an affordable unit for them. Um, we have challenges with our outreach staff working with people, but losing track of them as they wait for these options. And people, outreach staff getting stuck in really tough conversations where people aren't engaging, but just, just having really... Um, failed conversations despite impressive training and despite repeated attempts, just conversations falling apart with, with no progress being made towards solutions. Um, and I'm putting that mildly, um, just 
asking for stuff that we can't provide or just having incoherent or profane conversations instead of actually progressing towards services. Um, and the community looks to us when these situations deteriorate, when, when I get called every day, and I know a lot of you do too, with situations where people just need help with something that's happening in their area. Um, one area that's of particular concern to us right now is the abandoned RVs and the towing. We're running out of options. Our, our towing partners don't have any place to take um, what they have. And until we discover a solution around being able to rebuild tows, we're, we're getting concerned that we're not gonna be able to continue to respond to um, towing needs. I'm gonna quickly pause and see if Suzanne or Norm wanted to amplify that comment. Um, while they're coming online, I would say that I, we think this is a cost at the current status quo of about $200,000 a year to be able to help the RVs like this move to a different location. How, uh, Gretchen, how do these RVs get there? What's the deal with an RV arriving? Sure. Suzanne, yeah, are they do you want to take that? Are they part of our program? No, uh, no, these are the unmanaged spaces where um, people might be residing in an RV in a location that hasn't been permitted. We do, do we have get a, on those right away so we can have them drive away instead of us tow it away? That's that's the idea behind this response team is to be ah, able to okay. quickly go out. Um, Suzanne or Norm, would either of you like to comment on that? Yes, this is Suzanne Reynolds, Code Compliance Manager. Um, we get approximately um, two to three complaints per day of RVs inside um, neighborhoods, just on streets, um, sometimes in industrial areas. Um, sometimes they're all starting to group together. As soon as one stops, um, others join. Um, we respond to those pretty much immediately. Uh, if it's not the same day, it's the next day. Um, we tow two to three of those per week. Um, then obviously nobody wants uh, an RV with someone living in it in front of their house. So much like you were discussing, um, Mr. Mayor, the one in behind McDonald's, um, we have officers that go down that street every single day to make sure we tag and ask these people to move along. They do not always choose to move along. And oftentimes the RVs are of such a condition that they cannot move along. And that is when we go to um, the towing um, and we have to tow the vehicle. Quite often the people will abandon it at that point, knowing that they that it will be towed if they can't get it removed themselves. And that is where we hit the place of um, the fact that our towers, especially those contracted with us now as of last week, have absolutely no more space for any RVs. <laughs> I can add that we've also made modest investments through your general fund with mobile mechanic and towing services to help a person tow to a lawful location. But those situations don't present themselves always and the funds run out real quick. What, what's it mean, Suzanne, when you say they won't tow them? What, what happens to these uh, vehicles in each of these counselors' neighborhoods then? They will remain parked there and I will get a lot of angry phone calls that will then travel up to you. Yeah. Okay. So all of that is to say that we understand that in this period of time, I, I really appreciate the trajectory that I hope we're all on, which is towards our community's commitment to being built for zero, that in the meantime, people are remaining outside and in, in this period of time, we know um, that there will be people who are outdoors um, while we continue to make investments in more shelter, more housing, more solutions, we still will have people outside. And so tonight, um, it, it, a lot of people say, what's the plan? And it, and it might help as I've listened um, with each of you to hear and to think about a three-step plan to help us get where we need to be. One step is around creating an, a, an actual response team, the nonprofit work program and dedicated response so that we can get out there quickly and resolve issues right away. Um, another part of the plan must be maintaining the current beds that are available and the current street outreach that is available to be able to um, not lose ground in the recent investments that you and others have made recently. And then of course, 
growing the number of beds that are open to all genders is important. Um, we understand that while we're on this trajectory, in the meantime, the community is going to call us regularly and need the city's help in these situations. What we um, also understand is right now, we try to tap people who are at work in other departments. We um, have to lose them to other priorities like weather and emergency services. And I know Mark Bechtel is on and he'll have something to add here. We, um, we're we unable to get to sites and they grow and grow and grow and build and build. You, you know, you understand the proliferation that starts to happen and to be able to respond quickly coming alongside the supportive community outreach with finding solutions is, is part of what this is about. Mark, I want to ask you if you want to amplify the point about people might say, well, you have staff right now. And, and one of the challenges is that we tap the existing staff that are part of other other teams instead of have a team on this. Correct. Uh, yes. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. This is Mark Bechtel, Assistant Public Works Director over Operations. And uh, and Gretchen's correct. We, we do not have a dedicated um, group of people. Uh, that we can call on every day to do uh, cleanups uh, and sanitation work uh, in the field. We draw from our existing work units, and uh, and we also try to synchronize our efforts with our contractors, uh, namely a, a service master of Salem, and uh, and then they use a subcontractor, uh, Gliss Labor Services, uh, and we. We synchronize ourselves with their their availability, which is largely one day a week, which has become traditionally a Thursday. Uh, and we draw people uh, anywhere from seven to 10 public work staff from diff different work units, mainly parks operations, but we do draw from the utility operations and street maintenance. And, uh, and to kind of soften the impact on any one work unit, uh, as we pull them away from their normal duties to to then uh, support uh, the efforts of our contractors. Uh, we provide uh, vehicle support, uh, heavy equipment support, supervision, direction, tools, uh, hauling services. Uh, and we also just get in there and, and bag garbage ourselves as well. So it's a, it's a joint effort and the, uh, the numbers are staggering. If uh, I have some statistics, if you wanna hear them, but it is, it is a very large logistical effort. Does that mean, uh, Mark, that you would essentially have a team available uh, as soon as we started seeing tents going up in Marion Square Park that could go in and get that cleaned up? Or if they're on Liberty Street or they're on Union Street or they're in Lewis's backyard or, you know, what uh, is that what you'll be there for is to come in and clean the mess up? Essentially, that's correct. We, we've, we follow, we're, we're kind of the tail end of the process. You know, we, we come in at Public Works, we come in after our social service partners and Salem Housing Authority have come in and, right. and worked with the, uh, the folks. Uh, the police come in and post the campsites uh, so that they're clear of occupants before we come in. We come in three days later and the majority of the time the campsites are abandoned and we simply check them to see if there's any uh, possessions or valuables and then we do the cleaning. So, so yes, following that process, uh, instead of us doing that one day a week, that crew would be available uh, five days a week to go in and, and, and maybe get to some of these unmanaged areas before they get so large. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. We also have a uh, Salem Police Department present at cleanups to be able to assist um, resolving conflicts or issues, um, you know, right at the yeah. moment that they come and to help ensure everybody around is safe. We understand it's traumatic. It can be a traumatic experience. So we also need police at that time. Everyone involved must be trained in our resources and our other solutions to be able to help connect people with services as well. Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much. This is Virginia Stapleton. Um, this has all been really, really helpful and good for me to think about. Um, and I also have another thought circling in my mind, and that is that no matter how many pellet shelters we have or beds we have, if we don't have any housing further down the line, 
then we get stuck. And, and this continues to be where we're at. And so my question is, when you thought about increasing staff for different areas, was there any consideration to increasing staff for the Salem Housing Authority so that we could fast track some of the projects that they have really that are, you know, when I look at their, their forecast for projects, I get really excited about the opportunity for building, uh, you know, these housing projects that will end homelessness. So can you talk to me about that aspect? Have we thought about increasing on that side as well? No doubt it's needed. We must root for their success to succeed, but I, I might invite Kristen to speak to more strategies there. Um, thank you, Kristen Rutherford, with Urban Development Director, and we also have Nicole Utes, who's our Administrator at the Housing Authority, uh, on the call as well. Um, there certainly is a need for more capacity at the Housing Authority. Uh, we are moving as um, quickly and with as many resources we have to getting more housing stock online. Um, we have been discussing for the last couple of years a restructuring at the Housing Authority to build out components that are focused on homelessness and then focused on the, the property management needs and then new development that has been delayed by the COVID pandemic. But that is something that we have more recently been talking about moving forward in uh, a little bit later this year or um, into next year. So that the capacity piece is definitely a part of the bigger conversation beyond this more urgent need that we're addressing tonight. Right. So it's a stay tuned on this one. It, it is. And I mean, Nicole's okay. here. If she'd like to add anything to that. Nicole, did you... thank you. Uh, I think you. Hi, I'm Nicole Hughes. I'm the housing administrator for Salem Housing Authority, and I think you stated it well. Um, as we grow at the housing authority and we build more units out, our capacity is being stretched tremendously. And so we are uh, definitely. This is a strategic plan, and it's been a goal of this year for the agency to sit down and strategically guide ourselves into a better future to be able to keep up with the demand um, for housing stock, housing building development, and maintaining all of these projects that we have going on, as well as assisting our, our homeless community. Okay. And I need to also bring us back to the earlier point that the um, that, that slide about, and we remain with people outside, really significant long-term traumas, very significant addictions, very significant yeah. behavioral health issues where we're unable to make progress um, in despite trained advocates out there. I, I've been just struck as I learn about some of the really tough conversations they have where they're unable to make progress. And so just recognizing we will also have people who are outside until we can figure out the way to design the system that will be the most appropriate for them. And I think that's leaning on behavioral health partners and others to really try to solve some of these other types of needs that we encounter. There may be others here on the call who want to speak to that strongly, but just to help make that point, we'll have some will be able to help. And then others who at the moment, based on our current situations are remaining outdoors and, and therefore people call the city to handle the issues that arise as a result. Okay. All right. Um, then what's our next? Next, I wanted to help you understand a little bit more about your shelter site options for the micro shelters. As was noted, the um, Village of Hope is slated to close on the 15th. And so we wanted to give you an opportunity to discuss the potential sites. Okay. Um, you'd asked me to come back with some alternative shelter location, site locations. Can people see my screen yet? Yes. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry for being clunky with that. Oh, no, um, you're great. Oh, <laughs> you are very kind to me. You are very kind to me. So this is responding to the council direction. And I want to point out this is managed micro shelter, not unmanaged environments. We've just been talking about unmanaged spaces, but this instead right. is options around the managed micro shelter locations where case management, shower services and others are provided. So just to help orient everybody to that change. This one, oh, go ahead, Mayor. 
<laughs> one one question just uh, it came up earlier, and I can't remember if who one of the counselors brought it up, but do we have only money for one site? I mean, we have two sites right now. One's closing. Do, is that the really the money we have? Can we do more than one more site? I, I didn't quite understand the discussion. Thank you for asking. That shelter forecast laid out a scenario where you continued the funding at the site that can remain at Catholic Community Services and replaces the Village of Hope site. And then you see when we begin to go into the red. If you make different choices, then it changes the forecast. But that's part of the purpose of bringing you that forecast so you can you can see how that plays out. So one, are you rec recommending then one more site or two more sites? I'm not sure I'm understanding then with the funding options available right now, what? Thank you. If you go with what's in front of you, I know there's been some discussion to making some changes to that. If you went with what was in the sheltering forecast, you'd be looking to approve one additional site to replace the Village of Hope. But okay. the council may have other decisions and choices to make. You really have two potential future actions with these locations. Right. You could approve the act of micro sheltering at sites, but not have the dollars to fund them, or you could choose to fund operations at as many as you you want you wish to for as long as possible. There's a couple of choices. But do you need us to act fairly soon, replacing the site that's closing? I mean, is that one yes. more site? You need that fairly quickly. We do, yes. It's important to be able to begin the site preparations work and for the continuity of services and care, yes. Would you like us to then, as we listen to the discussion, or which we're getting a lot of discussion to add us, uh, along with the great information you're giving us, do you want us to be thinking about one site or what do you want us to be doing? Yeah, please be thinking about the sites and, and which ones are from your constituent input and, and from the outreach that you were able to read, the sites that are emerging for you. And then we're listening for your consensus or direction tonight on if there's a number of sites, you may wanna activate one number of sites, like maybe you approve at all four because you like it or you approve at two or three of the four. And then maybe there's another number that you're investing in financially. Okay, thanks. You, you're welcome. So as you, this also represents all that we could find. I had sincerely wanted more geographic diversity, um, but this represents everything that met the due diligence criteria we were able to locate. The first site, as you know, is the city owned Peace Plaza at 555 Liberty and would need to be augmented with some access for office space selecting a location for showers, whether that's in a shower tent across the street or here, and the parking um, we would need at windows to the west. Uh, the uh, other site we located is at 2410 Turner Road Southeast. That's the current property owned by church at the park, and they would propose using this property for this purpose. It would require some changes in the UDC, which are, which are um, coming for you. Gretchen, your slides are not advancing for us. Oh, dear. Really? No, all we're seeing is your first one. Oh, no. How is That's that okay. happening? Oh, all right. Oh, my screen sharing is paused. How about now? There you go. What do you see? The, the uh, Peace Plaza. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I hope I hope you'll forgive me. And should I pause, Councillor Anderson? Or I see yeah, your hand. Do you have a question? Oh, um, uh, no, I didn't. My question was, you're going to show us these that I think were, you know, part in item 6A on last council agenda. And that's what we're going through now with a little more detail. So thanks. Yes, sir. You're welcome. So there's the Turner Road location. We also have two privately owned parcels that have emerged that would meet the criteria, one at 1280 Center Street. Um, there we would have a cost in a monthly lease, as well as um, private property at the northwest corner of Front Street and Hood Street, also a cost in lease. 
So I will stop sharing my screen for Pete's sake and then see what kind of discussion there may be around sites. Councilor Lewis. You're, you're muted, Jim. My wife okay. likes it that way. Um, <laughs> just to, I'll throw out a hypothetical. Let's assume for a moment that the, uh, that the site owned by Church at the Park 2410 um, Turner Road would be the replacement for the existing site. Uh, they're both the same size and there's funding for that. So let's assume that if we were to choose any of the other three sites, for example, um, the property on Center Street that could hold 80 guests, um, the only thing that's missing is about the million and a half dollars a year to run it. So I, I'm wondering, I mean, I, I believe it's important to move rapidly to replace what we're gonna be losing in May. I'd like to be able to move quickly on at least one of the other two large ones, but I don't have a million and a half dollars. So what are the suggestions? This is Gretchen. Thank you, Councillor. Um, one idea could be to approve and invest in one of the larger sites, but understand that perhaps you don't have the operating dollars to fund it fully to capacity. That certainly green lights from a city land use perspective, the ability to operate that site and certainly sets the stage for inviting other funding partners to come in and help that site grow. From an operational standpoint, the preferred sites are the ones at Front Street and the ones at Center Street from a purely operational standpoint. So that's an all that's one way to look at it. Okay, Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Does staff have a recommendation in terms of uh, which of these sites we should consider first or any sort of ranking that you, in your evaluation, you certainly have a lot more information about them than we do. I'm just wondering if you have any sort of recommendation. Thank you. Our, our team that does due diligence with me, we would put the front street and the center street sites near the top operationally. They have the capacity to serve the most guests and to have everything at the location that would be necessary. Um, and then Turner Road would be third. We understand there would be services continuing at that given the ownership of the property and having a micro shelter investment there expands the staffing at that location 24 seven, which could be helpful to the neighbors. And then the last site would be Peace Plaza, which has a number of challenges. It removes it from the event space. We've got the parking across the street, a shower problem and case management location problem to resolve. Thank you. That's actually, um, ironically, kind of in line with what my thinking was in terms of the order. I don't like the idea of having folks cro needing to cross the street to get to a shower or parking. I think that's a recipe for disaster. Um, so I don't like that option uh, just because of for, for safety reasons. Um, but also, you know, and I, I understand from DJ's comments the other night that you know, we're talking about a slow rollout of these things. So I think it's a, I think it's critical we identify one. It's very, very important we identify a second one. And then the others, I think, you know, we, we have a little bit more time. And I, I'm hopeful that there will be some more sites emerging as potentials so in, in the future. So thank you. Gretchen, are, is this laid out somewhere uh, the way Chris described and you described your, your order of uh, preference or appropriateness or whatever you'd call it? I didn't bring that to you in written form yet, but I would anticipate with your direction, giving you a, a report on your next council meeting, which offers you a decision um, package where you could make a vote and I could bring that forward. Councilor Hoyt, is that what item. you're kind of thinking is you'd like to have that come forward that way? Yeah, I wanted to hear her, Gretchen's thoughts now, and then I would like to see it come forward in a formal written proposal, I, because it's important as, as we're all considering these, yeah. you know, what what have you seen that we ought to know about or maybe that we can't read about? So it's just important for me to hear your thoughts and your professional judgment yeah. as I consider all of that and all the other external factors. And I'm glad to see that we're basically in alignment. So I'm happy so far. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good good thing to be prepared for, Gretchen. Councillor Anderson. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, um, I agree with everything that you and um, Councillor Hoy have said, and I especially also agree with the rough priorities as laid out by uh, um, Gretchen Bennett. Uh, I would also say that one thing that has been raised a lot by the people in the public about the Peace Plaza is families and children at, at the library. And uh, yeah. um, there, there are good things to be said in terms of it's right there. It makes us focus all that other stuff. But there are there are really negative things uh, about the uh, the library and the kids and the family next to it, as well as crossing the two busy streets. Um, the other thing, this is just a general observation, is that this is exactly why uh, it's the result of the kind of city government we have: weak mayor, council, strong staff, and and. We need to trust the city manager and the staff to have done their due diligence and done all sorts of things beneath the water that we don't see. We only see what comes up above the water. So that's why I think Councillor Hoy's, uh, I know they're paddling like ducks below. That's, what comes up. that's why Councillor Hoy's uh, uh, discussion and reliance on the staff. Uh, and finally, uh, just so I, may, I can make sure, Gretchen, 1280 Center Street, that is a, the vacant lot across from the Safeway where the Pietro Belusky building used to be. It is the vacant lot across from Center Street. I don't know my history as well as you do. Yeah. It's 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 where the mayor used to live in an old apartment house that burned down back in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Not arson, I hope, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so that's good. And if possible, um, you know, I know where... Uh, Oh, yeah, one more thing about Turner Road. You know, that's Turner Road is basically Cascades Gateway Park. Uh, as we all know uh, from the folks at Paradise Island, there's been a huge problem there, and the city keeps trying to, we keep trying to take care of it, and it keeps festering again. So uh, I, I would hope that if we were to go with the uh, Church of the Park Turner Road with the fact that it's 24 seven, there will be people there, uh, it'll be monitored. Uh, it should alleviate the, the, the problem that, that is constantly there. Uh, um, and the, the real problem is not with the um, managed campgrounds, it's with the unmanaged campgrounds. And I would hope that putting in a managed campground there would alleviate the problems uh, tend to with the with the unmanaged and finally could you put up the uh, slide that shows the uh, front avenue and hood i have a general idea where it is but i just like to see what it looks like and is it is it which side of front avenue the river side or the the opposite uh, side oh good okay it's the west side can you see that okay um well i can see something but i don't know what it is i'm looking at you're looking at a close-up um the left of your screen is west in the Willamette River. No, I know that. I just don't know where, 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 where Hood and and uh, 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 I see front. Where's Hood? Thank you. Um, it, th this particular map is showing shipping just directly on the north end, and I understand Hood to be on the south end, although the map doesn't say that at the moment. Okay, okay. Counselor, th this is Kristen. This is yes. just north of the Truett property. Okay, okay. Well, once again, on that, uh, 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 on this, uh, where is it? I see at the bottom, um, uh, case management text, whatever that means on the left-hand side. Is that where it is, or is it up where it says, Proposed alignment for underground power. I mean, I'm sure it's none of those places, but I'm I'm so sorry. So the that entire thing, that's a close up of what that site could look like. It's a it's a sketch drawing of how it would work. If you can see little pink boxes, those would be um, as many as 40 micro shelters fit there, oh, so it could serve 80 people. Okay. Okay. And, <laughs> and the green little boxes, like a case management tent, portable got toilet, it. storage okay. containers, et cetera. I understand that perfectly with no allusions to John Cougar Mellencamp. <laughs> Love it. To your, point about, to your point about Turner Road, one area we're really struggling with is keeping up 
with challenges at locations. I'm, I'm hearing regularly from the residents over in your ward about um, growing camping at Cascades Gateway yeah. Park and a number of challenges and issues. And that's a good example of where we haven't been able to affect people coming inside or getting there in a timely fashion like the community expects. Yeah. We have people not engaging with us continuing to come in despite the closure and it's just a repeat 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 um urgent challenge for the neighbors and for those there because that's not a livable solution for them either so excuse me mr mayor one more question i'm yes. hearing i'm hearing complaints too of course uh, all the time and gretchen you and i have been at the at the semca meetings to to hear those um uh, justified concerns my question is are you saying that you think that having this be managed and 24 seven and people on site would also help the issue of people not being able to come into the park and keeping keeping them out. Uh, forgive me. No, I was wanting to make the point that um, without increased investment in response services, we'll continue to scrub to struggle with the unmanaged locations okay. like what we're dealing with right now at Cascades Gateway Park. So you were making the opposite point that I was hoping you were making. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also true that having 24 seven staff at Turner Road will, that will contribute, we understand to the livability of that area and to the safety and the security right there. But we can't hold them responsible for the far north end of Cascades Gateway, for example. Okay, Councilor Hoy, could you take this over for a few minutes? Will do, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. You bet. And with that, uh, I'm going to call on myself. So, and then I'll get to some other hands. So, uh, I just wanted to remind everybody about our language and the words that we use. And uh, I, I heard it suggested earlier that it may not be safe for us to have folks like near the library and might not be safe because there's kids there. And I just want to suggest that actually, I don't think there's any evidence that shows having one of our managed sites in an area makes it less safe. And in fact, I would even suggest that perhaps there's a learning opportunity there for kids and children who might be frequenting our library to really learn about the compassionate way to address homelessness and what it's what it means to be homeless and that sort of thing. So we can actually start teaching kids from an early age, you know, about the realities of homelessness. So I just want to throw that out there again. And I just I don't want to let it as let it go unsaid or unchallenged when we kind of talk about Oh, it's unsafe. We don't have any information showing that. We we know that unmanaged situations are definitely create uh, challenges for livability, for neighbors, for safety, all sorts of things. But our, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a managed situation. Councilor Hoy, Councilor Okay, could I respond to that just right now? Before yeah, and I wasn't speaking just yeah. specifically to anything no, you said. I understand, but what I'm also saying, that's the perception from the public. And when I sure. raised that, uh, you were raised to traffic issues and also other people have been raising that issue. Uh, I tend to fall on your side of the fence on that, but that's not, that's not how it's perceived by, by other people, but you're right. Understood. Okay. Uh, Councilor Stapleton. Thank you, Councilor Hoy. This is Virginia Stapleton. Um, I had a quick question in reference to Councilor Lewis's question earlier um, about the million and a half um, that it takes to run one of these camps. And my question is is on sorry i'm looking at so many different handouts on the one that we were looking at earlier uh, with josh um on that first micro shelter where where that is the portland road and hopefully the new site we would still have 1.1 million to put towards that from state funding is that correct if i may i'll just put it up real quick and make sure we're talking about the same thing yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, so you, you mean um, yes? Here, this amount here. Yes. Yeah. So we're showing the use of that state sheltering grant for next year to continue operating it at the new site. Okay. So then the difference that we're missing in our budget is a little over three hundred thousand, I believe, which is a lot better than my the one and a half which I was really worried about trying to find, <laughs> at least for a year. And my next question is for Gretchen. On the, on the handout that we got from Church at the Park in our, um, 
in our information packet. On the top, we have 40 guests, which is one uh, 1.426, and then 80 guests is one uh, one million four hundred and seventy six thousand and some change. Um, if I said that correctly, Are, do either of these locations, the the ones that were kind of top, the top two considering ones, um, the Center Street location and the Front Street location, do either of those have the ability to go to 80 or the space to go to 80 to kind of capture that savings um, between the two different numbers? And then would we even want to go to that? Because I, I feel like I've heard that 40 uh, shelter uh, sites is, is or um, shelters is really kind of the sweet spot as far as managing a site. Can you speak to that? Yes, the, um, thank you, this is Gretchen. The two sites at front and center have the capacity for 40 shelters to serve 80 guests. And that reflects ultimately what we're currently experiencing at the locations we have right now um, at CCS and then at a um, little bit less at the other, the Village of Hope location. And um, they shared their outcomes that they're starting to achieve with a number of people who are exiting to a positive destination. And so, so far um, in our research, it appears to be a good workable number. Um, our code is not permitting growing beyond 40 micro shelters. So the cap that we're working with right now is 80 while we all learn together. Okay. Did that respond to your question? Yeah, you did great. I, I do have one more question that you sparked for me and, and Cancel Roy, if it's okay if I add another question here. Um, Gretchen, when we talk about positive outcomes for folks, um, that language is really broad. And so I would love to start the conversation about, and, and please, now is not the time we can circle back to it, um, but what is the language that we're going to be using with providers um, to really gauge how these are working. Uh, positive outcomes to me is a little too vague. I would love to have a better understanding of what the different um, destinations are for folks um, because I don't want it to be, um, I guess, misleading as in people are getting positive uh, destinations and maybe circling back into homelessness rather quickly because that positive destination maybe was a friend's couch um, or instead of, you know, a lease that is, you know, for a year or, or whatnot, that we can really gauge some positive outcomes. Could you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. And I, this is Gretchen, Cynthia, and I, I think that what I imagine that you would want to see, counselors, is an alignment with our regional system. So an example of an exit to a positive destination might be the permanent supportive housing model, for example, and the other types of objectives that our overall region has um, to have a more livable solution for a person, a HUD definition shelter solution. So that's the kind of direction um, that these and other investments would be feeding into. Yeah, that would be really, really helpful for me and I think for others and the community so that they know really what they're getting uh, for their money, for their investment here. And um, I think I had, darn it, I had another question. Um, Hold that thought, Counselor, and I'll get to Counselor Gonzalez and then come back to you. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. You bet. Counselor Gonzalez. Yeah, thank you, Counselor Jose Gonzalez. You know, I um, have a question for Gretchen but, Gretchen, but I have a few comments about those sites. You know, the uh, front street makes sense, complete sense to me. Peace Plaza doesn't for many reasons. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, Turner Road, I think, is a great future space. And uh, the center street, I just want to bring a couple of things up is um, even though it's not close to, I mean, it's sort of out there, you know, in this sort of business, business section, but that Safeway, it's like a hub for the North Salem high schoolers. You know, so there's always um, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., there's a, there's a constant traffic there. You know, so even though it's not close to a school, for some reason, those North kids are always at that Safeway. You know? um, but the other reason, too, is it reminds me of when it was the unmanaged camp under the Market Street. And I'm not saying about when we talk in this case, the safety of the residents inside that campsite. What, what happened a lot was um, people are trying to sleep under the bridge and people would drive by, honk all night, say things, do things, you know, because they were just right there. You know, so as I'm thinking about the center street, I can't imagine how it'd be laid out, but I can imagine that same thing 
um, happening there. And that's why the front street makes a lot of sense because it seems like there'd be a little more peace there. This one over here, we're putting them in that high noise, you know, and um, try to live off Fisher Road. I mean, I, that's that noise pollution is crazy. You know, so I'm, I'm thinking about, I mean, it seems, it seems to make sense for a lot of reasons, but from that point of view, you know, it's not as, as good of a spot. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Stapleton, did you, are you ready? Yes, I it. did remember. Thank you, Go Virginia Stapleton. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the expectations that we're setting for how um, how quickly we can get folks into housing. And I know that this kind of contradicts my, my points earlier about not having housing to get people into and how we're kind of stocking things up here. Um, but I also think that clearly communicating, and I think that this meeting does that, um, the limitations to our budget to continue to fund things like this um, with our service providers so that we're all on the same team and all on the same expectations as far as how long can we really provide this level of service uh, before our budget really runs out. So that would be my uh, question for staff to really make sure that we're communicating well with people that are providing service. Thank you, Councillor. And I'll get to you in one second, Councillor Lewis. I just wanted to do a quick check-in with staff. How are we doing on time? I see that it's 7.30. Are we okay still to keep going in this conversation or do we need to move on soon? I, I'll, I, Pauline may want to answer that. I wanted to offer, I know we wanted this to have a good amount of time and I, I want to also prompt Nicole to speak to some of these issues as well. I think having Nicole's voice in this at least briefly would be really important, but sorry, Colleen, Courtney, you may have wanted to speak to Councillor Hoy's question. Um, Councillor Hoy, uh, this is Courtney, Cynthia. Um, I'd just like to be sure that you have the time to really talk about these issues. This issue in particular, I think, is the preeminent among our residents and among council at this moment, and it deserves the time that you have to give it. So, so let's focus on that. We can always come back with the other items in the policy agenda at as you wish, or we can just take it forward um, at a future meeting at, you know, as a recommendation for your discussion. So, so really okay. this is the, the should be, I think the focus, and we could return back to the financial projections again, when we're finished having this conversation, I think just to kind of um, solidify where you'd like to go in the next year's policy guidance for us. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole, did you have something on this? Good evening, I'm Nicole Youths. I'm just uh, here to respond to any questions. I know Councillor Stapleton, anybody about the housing situation, housing dynamics. I do know there's a lot of pressure on the housing authority to come up with available units um, for permanent supportive housing for all these different programs that are out there. And just wanted to be mindful that we don't have an endless stock of um, permanent supportive housing. They don't turn as quickly as regular apartments do. So um, we are trying to build them as quickly as we can with both the Aquinnah coming on in 13 months, Sequoia Crossing is hopefully closing and another 13 month build out. Um, and then Redwood Crossings, which is a very successful program, but we're just starting to see those move out of that uh, facility and starting to recycle into new. Um, our waiting lists are long, but we're not the only housing provider and we do have a lot of voucher Utilization, it really comes down to when HUD can get the numbers up for our rental assistance to be able to afford the apartments in the Salem area. Thank you, Ms. Hughes. Uh, Councillor Lewis. Yes, uh, thanks, Councillor Hoy. I uh, wanted to bring up, there's a there's a graph that DJ Vincent has been showing to the um, community meetings. Uh, um, Gretchen is familiar with that, but I think that that graph could maybe help aid our discussion because it basically starts from unmanaged camps and goes through a system and ending up with um, permanent housing. There's multiple steps in between, but that graph I think would be very a visual, uh, which would help the conversation, I think. Thank you, Councillor. I think I saw Councillor Nordyke's hand go. Yes, Councillor Nordyke. Thank you, Councillor Hoy. Uh, Ms. Utes, while we have you on the line, I'm, I am, I know about the wait list for our properties. Uh, do you have a sense of what the wait lists are like for some of the other providers in town? 
Um, I know the Arches Inn, which is one of the new facilities that we helped open uh, with a little bit of city money and, and support and a lot of support from the state and a lot of support from Community Action Agency, who really uh, deserves the credit for this one. As I understand it, the Arches Inn right now is prioritizing wildfire survivors. And the intention is that eventually those folks will move out as more housing becomes available to them and they can then transition to serving the local homeless population. So that's just like one example that comes to my mind. Um, can you, I would assume that pretty much all the other housing options are on wait list right now around the city. Uh, but is, if there's any more detail you can provide, that would be helpful. So maybe to give you a sense, the micro shelters themselves have a 300 plus individual waiting list to get into the micro shelters. Almost every service provider is seeing a pretty lengthy waiting list to get into some of these programs. And keeping in mind that Arches Inn is a slow rollout. So only I believe the first floor is being utilized and that is, like you said, prioritized for wildfire evacuees. And, and the other um, new program with um, Center for Hope and Safety is a domestic violence focus. And then if they have availability and can assist is um, we'll be offering also to the homeless program. So um, yes, I, I can't tell you for certain, but I can tell you that almost every where we try to connect individuals to has quite a lengthy waiting list at the moment, which I, in my eyes would be 12 to 18 months. Thank you. Thank you. I see Ms. Bennett has shared her screen. I think this probably is what Councillor Lewis was referencing a minute ago. Gretchen, is there, did you want to say something about it? or Councillor Lewis, I might invite you to, if you like, it just helps to illustrate the pathway. We have people outside. We work hard to try to connect. There are some that we will be successful inviting into managed sites, shelters, hotels, and then from there, can we, how many, can we get people rapidly rehoused into transitional housing, into permanent supportive housing, ultimately towards permanency and self-sufficiency, but it illustrates that pathway. Trying to build out a math algorithm to help you all be able to help us all as a region be able to predict the, the numbers around that. You know, how many do we need? What's the inputs? What's the what's the outputs and where where will we be successful? Keeping in mind, we won't be successful with each person right now, the way our current, the way our current structure is set up. You, you know, Gretchen, the only thing I could add um, is, and this is for my benefit, it, it'd be nice to know where the choke points are. And if it's possible at all, to identify a time frame, here's a choke point that is six months or six years uh, in the waiting, but just something to give us a realiz realization of how this can flow and, and in some cases how it's not. Probably a choke point exists in the three columns on the right, I would say, between managed sites, emergency shelters, transitional housing, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, and permanent housing. Those are all choke points because they're just we don't have capacity. Yeah, point. I thought I thought the only the only unchoke point was the unmanaged sites. Pretty much, I think our outreach capacity is fairly substantial at this point, but um, could always be more, of course. Councillor Phillips, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hoy. This is uh, Trevor Phillips, uh, Ward Three. So, um, uh, you know, my question uh, would be: uh, we we got some data presented to us in, in uh, Gretchen Bennett's first slideshow where uh, you talk about how many people were at the point in time unsheltered last year or the year before, like 900 little, like mid 900s. And then that currently right now there's about 460 uh, shelter beds. So my, my math question would be uh, how many shelter beds existed at the time of that, you know, count of about, you know, mid 900 uh, in terms of people being unsheltered. That data would help me because I because if it's uh, you know the it, that's great that we have that many but uh, it, it, functionally it's not enough and that you know like it looks like I, we got what I wanted like we got half of what exists but that's what it took to create the thousand so you need to you know eat into the one thousand that's the next half so you know we're still short 
you know, hundreds of, of shelter, but I'm sure we're in a better place than we were a year ago because of the strong work of everybody here tonight and throughout the community. Uh, but that data would be helpful. Um, in terms of like, you know, sharing my thoughts on the presentation of, you know, which of these uh, four sites, any of them would be fine with me. Um, I think the counselor's Hoy question on, you know, getting information from staff as to which ones are preferential. I, I would then gravitate more towards, you know, the front street and center street properties because they could be expanded and they, they're better for the, uh, you know, the operational functioning. Um, I, I, I do uh, agree that we should approve more than one because I'm concerned that we could run into unforeseen issues. Um, we could not do the, the West Salem site because of, you know, the flooding issues. So I want to make sure that we have, you know, more than one possibility to pursue. Um, you know, my, I think that Turner Road, it makes sense to me that it's kind of third on the list, but I, I have confidence that we could work with that owner. So, you know, I, I don't want it to drop off of the list. Um, and then I'm not sure I understand the math question that uh, Councillor Virginia asked, um, which is, you know, the, the, I understand that we can continue with two sites through 2024, you know, as outlined in the document that uh, Josh uh, brought up initially. Um, but I don't understand the financial, you know, difference between uh, 20 shelters at one site, you know, when the, the one at Portland Road switches to a new site. Uh, if we do expand it to 40, what is that difference in pricing? Um, I personally think that, you know, there are questions that we as counselor and council have to figure out, and that is, do, do we prioritize the rapid response clean team or do we, you know, prioritize, you know, more sheltering? That's tough. Like I, tonight, I don't have an answer to that question for you. I, I mean, in a perfect world, we get more shelter sites, we get the, the, the rapid response clean team, you know, we get a civilian led mobile crisis response unit, but it's not a perfect world. These are scarce dollars. And, you know, it's easy to spend them on, on, you know, things that I think the community does want. So, you know, those are challenging questions to answer. So if I could just make a suggestion, Councillor Phillips, thank you for your comments. If I could just make a suggestion as it relates to the spreadsheet and the money, I think that's excellent. Uh, context for the council to consider but i would encourage us to not get too hung up on the numbers right now and focus more on the policy direction and then we have some expert staff here who are really great at the numbers and when we set the direction and tell them what we're thinking they can come back to us and say okay well here are the financial implications of your decision as opposed to us trying to like do the math in our heads on the fly while we're having this sort of great policy discussion. I wouldn't get too hung up on the spreadsheet tonight. That's just my way of looking at it. I want to focus really on the on the policy conversation. And then Josh is going to give us the, the financial reality check in the near future about about what those decisions means and about what other choices we might want to make uh, if we don't, you know, if it doesn't pencil out. I, I would just suggest that. And back to, I think, three points ago that Councillor Phillips made in his conversation about the count. Remember that the point in time count is just a point in time. Okay, it's literally a snapshot. It's not the best way to track the home, homeless population in our community. There are other methods that we, the Homeless Alliance is developing that actually through our coordinated, uh, uh, I lost, the, lost with the, the words, but the coordinated entry system. And, and we have a database that actually tracks the homeless people on an ongoing basis and when they exit out of homelessness and that sort of thing. And so it really takes a holistic look at who is that need, who has the need in our community. So the, I think the point in time count is a good indicator to sort of, um, to give us a snapshot of where we're at, but so many factors impact how accurate those numbers are. Like, are we in the middle of a pandemic? Was it pouring down rain on, you know, during the count? I mean, how many volunteers did we have? There's a lot of variables that really can bring the accuracy of that. And that's a HUD, um, it's really a HUD count that we have to do, but it's not necessarily the best way to count homeless people in our community. We have other numbers that we have available to us. So I just want to toss that out there. And one more point, and I'll quit hogging the mic, but um, in my other capacity, I have introduced a legislative concept to, uh, 
actually potentially use some underutilized state property for the purposes of siting some of our micro shelter communities. You know, I, who knows if it'll pass or who knows how successful it'll be. I do have a conversation coming up about it and I'm really hopeful that we'll get, make some really great progress with DAS on using some of the underutilized state property. So we might have more options available to us in the near future. I'm very hopeful. So Councillor Phillips. Thank you. I, I think that's an excellent point, uh, Councillor Hoy. Yeah, again, Trevor Phillips, Ward 3. So, um, you know, my first thought is we should pursue more than two. I mean, we, we, I, the numbers were so good, even if we're, we're overstating how impactful they were with 37% and 72% of people going through the two current sites, um, getting to a, the next step in the process, even temporarily we need more shelter sites. We, that's a, you're getting a ton of, of, you know, return on investment, however you want to phrase that you're doing good for humans in our community. Um, so I would certainly look at trying to expand that, uh, you know, at, we have to continue with at least two, but I would argue we need to get a third and fourth online rapidly. And even if that means, you know, just being honest with the community, like, it's great that people donated, you know, six hundred, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for one-time micro shelter sites, but we need, you know, funding for operations. You know, this is difficult, expensive work to provide services for these community members. So one-time funds are, are great. We appreciate it. We care deeply, but we got to fund this work for, you know, a year, two years, three years in a row, and it's it's not going to be easy. But I, I think we should do it. So that's my policy input on this difficult conversation. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Councillor Hoy. This is Virginia Stapleton. Um, I agree with Councillor Phillips on this. I uh, feel strongly that we need to move forward with the two, um, the one on Center Street and the one on Front Street. One, because they house 40 units each instead of the other two only housing 20. I think we get uh, our dollars that are spent are more efficient the more with, with the, uh, the more housing shelters that we have at a unit. So I feel like that money is better spent on the locations that can house 40. My question uh, for you, Gretchen, is the leases that we would sign at these two locations, are those a one-year lease? The lease would be signed between the nonprofit operator and the property owner. And uh, the city um, would fund through this fiscal year and then through your budget process, consider commitments for the next fiscal year and so on. Okay, thank you. Just thinking about uh, hopefully the good work that Councilor Hoy can get done at the state level. If we find, you know, locations later that would be more cost effective, I would love to be able to to relocate to a cheaper um, lease or hopefully no lease uh, sites in the future. Thank you, Councilor Stapleton. Are there other? Oh, Councilor Nordyk. Uh, thank you. I just want to uh, just reiterate in terms of the policy discussion that instead of spending $2.8 million on a sanitation team, I think that it makes more sense to focus on the services that connect people to shelter, uh, the people that can help de-escalate people in the field, and the people who can ultimately get folks to shelter as well. I think the more people we have indoors, the less garbage we have, you know. So I really, again, I'm, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think that is not a good use of these one-time funds at all. And I really urge council to think carefully about the opportunity costs of the, the sheer size of the sanitation team and what it would honestly do. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Just kind of following up on that, I would also like us to consider more of a proactive approach to trash rather than a, a reactive approach. You know, maybe if we gave, gave people a meaningful opportunity to dispose of their trash, uh, who, people who are unsheltered, you know, maybe it wouldn't the cost wouldn't rack up as high because they had a if they had a place to put it. So that's that's one thing I would like us to consider is an actual proactive approach um, instead of a reactive approach that requires, you know, it's pretty staff intensive. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, are there other questions or comments from council or staff? 
I should let you know, just, just to help the community know, we have absolutely been after that proactive approach, just like you said, how can we engage people? How can we provide things? Marion Square Park might be a good example, and there may be others here who can speak to it as well. Uh, we provided a dumpster, and I think a real full court press with our nonprofit partners to help communicate with folks about um, it's so important to have the garbage into the receptacles for everyone's health and safety and livability. And um, I, I, I think it's been a fail. I, when I go by, I'm so sad at how much garbage is around the dumpster instead of in the dumpster. And we've just had, we have some people earnestly working hard to try to help their campsites and areas be clean and many, many others with behavioral health and addictions challenges and other just daily living challenges that get in the way of that succeeding. Um, so we've, we're, um, we come back to it rolling to uh, the city team to have any kind of livability and this potential nonprofit Clean Start program investment. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. Councilor Phillips. Thank you, uh, Councilor Hoy. Again, Trevor Phillips, Ward 3. So um, I, I feel like that city staff is being very earnest right now. And the only thing that I think might be mistitled is the, 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 the concept this is potential investments. What I'm hearing from staff is that there's a need here. I don't want this to be the reality that we live in, um, my God. Uh, but this is the world as it is. And I, I feel like, you know, as, as imperfect as this may be, that, that staff's request for this, you know, cleanup uh, crew, uh, you know, it may seem flawed. It may seem like there, there are better things to do, but it's it's hard to discount if you listen to the details and the earnestness with which they're they're making this request. So, you know, it's a tough situation. Uh, I want to use these funds for shelters. You know, I want to prioritize, you know, a civilian led mobile crisis response unit. But this it's just tough policy wise. Like we got to prioritize and, you know, we got to pick the choke points along the way as best we can. Thank you, Councillor. Ms. Yutes. Hi, Nicole Yutes again with Salem Housing Authority. I just wanted to try to help Gretchen and all of you out a little bit and put a picture behind why um, the actual garbage situation is so dire at this point. Um, it's not only a situation for livability, health, and sanitation, but it's also a bit of an accountability issue. It's become a, um, a a plea from the housing authority as well that unless we make efforts to try to um, either provide the cleaning teams and the crews or, or trucks to come out um, and, and start training and teaching that this isn't unacceptable and in this area around their um, RVs or their tents is not going to be acceptable. We carry that into housing oftentimes, not by all, but by some, and it then becomes turns into an eviction situation or a lease enforcement situation that then they become housed and they potentially could lose their housing again. So we feel as though this is a multi-step situation needed and necessary to also help instill the factors of transitioning from being homeless into housing. And I can tell you that our outreach team is out there continuously with garbage bags and continuing to try to help with this situation for public works and other entities. And in some cases it's very successful, but we're also trying to train them that if they can keep this area clean, we can help advocate for them to get into housing much faster by stating we witness that this area is clean. So um, I think that's part of Gretchen's response is, is us trying to advocate that we, we need to see some improvement in this area. Thank you, Ms. Yates. I appreciate your comments. The, the first level of accountability is just setting an expectation for folks. And if we've never, you know, if we've never provided trash receptacles in a meaningful way throughout the city, and people have been living homeless in a homeless situation for a number of years, until until we change the expectation, the, the behavior isn't going to just automatically change. We have to help people and, and understand how the, the expectation is different now. And we're providing you with options and, you know, here's how you utilize them. And, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of work that we can, we can do there because, you know, left people left to their own devices without expectations are going to do what they do. But once you set that out there, I think, I think, it, I think we can pretty quickly start changing that dynamic. So that's just in my experience. 
Other questions or comments for staff or from staff? So given the situation and in consult, like given the late hour and in consultation with the city manager, um, I'm inclined to close the meeting then and revisit the next topics uh, at our next work session. Unless there are other things that people would like to discuss about this topic, I certainly don't want to cut it short. I am not seeing any hands. I'm not hearing any words. So that leads me to believe that you all are okay with that, uh, with that suggestion. I thank you, uh, Colleen, for being with us this evening. Thank you. Uh, it's, look forward to working with you on the remainder of the topics when we have time to discuss them in depth. And thank you to all the staff who stayed here late uh, with us uh, to uh, do this important work. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. For more videos and for more information, go to capitalcommunitymedia.org and follow us on social media.